Yeah. So I think I sent you a message. First movie I got in full. Second one I definitely got. Third one, lots of skipping. Um, <laughs> I didn't think I necessarily wanted to watch all of it. <laughs> and um, you told the Mars one. Yeah, I was that I was hoping I'd love it. And I was like, not in. Also, um, for my other podcast this week, um, this right now we just did Lawrence of Arabia. And next we have to do Once Upon a Time in America. So that those are big requests on your viewing two four hour movies, right? <laughs> it's it's a uh, they're all like similar time range, right? Isn't this all like nineties? Uh, Once Upon a Time in America is actually early eighties. Oh, oh, you mean the Brave Little Toasters, right? Yeah, uh, ninety seven, ninety eight for the second two. So eighty seven. And you and you watched them in the right order. Uh, yeah, but I watched the first one properly, taking notes and all that sort of stuff. Second one, I, I watched Accelerated and occasionally skipping stuff when it got slow, because this was all like last night, right? And then <laughs> Mars, I mean, you know, I looked at the wiki and saw what the plot was, and Mars was like e- e- big, big skips. I, more like I got a taste of that one. <laughs> Which so is... I think I watched them all at like 2x, uh, but <laughs> I did watch them all. Okay, and and I even read the novellas, the two that, two that I, I'm aware of. I don't know if there was a novella that represented the second movie. I I honestly, I think the second movie is is weird. It's a weird one, man. It's like a Super <laughs> Mario Brothers two almost. Yeah. You know, we're already like right into it. Why don't I just say the introduction? It's called Disney. This is Matt here. It's a paranoid American there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, we are spanning the globe right now. If you haven't worked out with going to Mars and stuff, this is the mostly the brave little toaster, but we both uh, tasked ourselves to at least um, quickly scan and or watch the two later sequels, which I think we're both direct to video, if I'm correct. Yeah, so it's so basically it's brave little toaster, brave little toaster to the rescue and then Brave Little Toaster goes to Mars. And that's the order that you watch them in. But apparently Brave Little Toaster goes to Mars might have been released prior to the second one coming out, but they do follow an order. And I mean, you know, it's it only matters as much as the Brave Little Toaster story commands that it matters, but it definitely does build. So the characters that they introduce in the first movie get added on by the second movie. And then by the third movie, you know, like you kind of have to know what characters fill what roles and they have a lot of like, you know, um, sort of callbacks. It, it's a, it's really interesting. man. It's like a, a very long fever dream that kept, keeps getting weirder and weirder as you watch it. Yeah, it's, it's only recently that I guess like proper release order has become like demanded. You know, you go back to like Star Trek, you know, it, it doesn't start with a pilot. It starts with a man trap, which is like a half assed episode of original Star Trek. And then you get like where no man's gone before like episode eight or something like that and it's like what's what's going on here that doesn't make sense and then and then the original pilot of star trek is just the menagerie which is the crew of the enterprise sitting around and watching an episode of star trek which is is great but yeah you know order order didn't matter so much then and i guess in the late 90s it didn't like they made them in the right order but they released them in the wrong order is that how it went uh, I didn't look into the the technical production of these, but I got the sense that it was two different production companies. So it might have been, hey, we want to knock out this brave little toaster while you know while it's still hot. So Company A, you're gonna make this movie, and Company B, you're gonna make this movie. It, it felt like it had some of that to it, uh, and I think maybe for whatever reasons, movie B ended up getting the budgeting and the marketing and just like completed before the first one did or at least to the distribution because brave little toaster goes to mars came out or was officially released before brave little toaster uh saves the day whatever the hell's uh brave little toaster the rescue so So, it was it was released in a weird order not that it it like all of these movies too i didn't know this before we, we got into this but they're based on books uh or technically novellas like little short stories that would probably fit in like a magazine somewhere uh and they weren't necessarily written as like a kid audience although i guess you you could have because the author did have like a grammar book that he put together but he also has a lot of adult dystopian science fiction and if you reread the brave little toaster movies uh just the transcripts or like the original novellas 
they take a completely different spin to them when you read it as what it truly was supposed to be i think which is uh dystopian sci-fi yeah and um i i guess i should throw out this is the first one we've done that isn't quite disney this is a uh... Directed by Jerry Rees, uh, screenplay, story by his, his name. I mean, other people too, but he's got his name on a lot of this. But uh, Hyperion Pictures, and then... And Disney gets, gets credits in the end for doing like title sequences and stuff. So they, they had their mark on it in a few places. Right, but we we are like, you know, we start with Fantasia, which was on like a certain track, right? And this is the first time when we're, we've got something like a little bit of an outlier, so which a little, little bit of a detour it, it doesn't and you can at least for me i could tell it didn't have that very specific disney touch to it uh, and i still struggle to put it into words whatever that like extra missing thing is but it just it didn't feel like it fit in the same kind of uh formula that we're used to after watching all of them so far but one of the reasons we are taking this detour is uh apparently this had i don't think i saw this as a kid i mean i would have been like about the right age to have seen this but i just somehow didn't i guess it wasn't like a massive hit or anything but, none of the three none yeah, of them none of them i i, I mean I, i'd like you know probably seen a poster seen a vhs box or something before but i'd never really like i guess thought i mean let's face it even if you put eyes and a mouth on it, a toaster doesn't stand out that much. But um... <laughs> <laughs> but what if it's brave? What if it's a brave toaster? We have to watch the movie to see that's brave or read the novella, I guess. But uh, <laughs> but you you were somewhat enamored with this one, was it? Uh, well, so not not necessarily the first one, but I I remember seeing it on TV, and it would be one of those things that I didn't remember it coming out in theaters, and I don't even remember it coming out in the video store. But I remember seeing it just in the middle of the day, flipping through channels. And being surprised that I didn't already know about it because it is like a very high budget, you know, relatively high budget animation. It looks like, you know, about as good as the 90s before you start talking into the the Disney Renaissance, which is coming right at the heels of this one, ironically. But uh, this one, I think I was most enamored with the modern interpretation of going to Mars. So so the trilogy kind of matters here to build up to the story. But the going to mars is this like weird again like a dystopian but it's like this communist anti-consumerist uh, um like robot army of appliances that are hell-bent on destroying humanity because we had the audacity to create the concept of planned obsolescence driven by a uh, christmas tree topper known as tinselina and this is all verbatim from the original novella that made its way into the movie as well, you know, into the, the third Brave Little Toaster. And for whatever reason, man, that just that like itches so many scratches that I've got of dystopian science fiction, you know, ro like AI slash robots taking over and, and destroying humanity. And it's all because of our own consumerism and how, you know, like the just the fact that they say planned obsolescence in the movie and in the original novella, I don't know, just tickles me beyond reason. And uh, I think that this also is kind of like a prototype for a toy, toy story, obviously. That's all in the room. <laughs> well, that, that's part of the elf in the room. But the other part, too, is that this is um like a good example of a weird pro hoarder pro consumerist thing where it's like it's good to buy a bunch of toys and it's good to get attached to them to the point where you never want to let that blanket go and you never want to let that you know that radio go and it's it's for me it's a it's a weird sort of a, a conundrum because on one side it's like yeah it's it's better to for almost everyone to just keep repairing the same thing over and over but the the way that they portray it in brave little toaster and then in, later in toy story even more so but it's like you're actually falling in love with these inanimate objects and the inanimate objects love you back and then if you throw them out it's almost like you're torturing them or you're hurting them or or you're like destroying this relationship that you've nurtured with that trademarked you know thing that you purchased from the disney store you know so in the, the long run as you extrapolate all the way out it's like don't throw out disney ip because it has a soul <laughs> that's kind of what they're painting at, at the very end well i mean you know i'm like haha that you know funny people would do that but i'm i'm equally brainwashed right i've got you know uh, as an adult i've got too many guitars in my room with with 
brand names on the headstocks and some of them are redundant. I have one that I totally should get rid of, but it's no, I don't want to do that. It's, it's my friend, right? It sings to me <laughs> when I play it, that sort of thing. Right. I've named him. Yeah. 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 Well, that, that one's actually the, uh, it, it, it's the Bob Marley signature edition. So you can't name it once they've done that. Right. But yeah, you can name your other one. Sure. I, I liked uh slash from he, Guns N' Roses. Call Bob. You just got to yeah. call Bob all the time. I actually call the Marley. Right. But <laughs> <laughs> Marley again. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, but, yeah, I was uh, looking through it. It seems Slash named one of his guitars, Slash from Guns N' Roses, named one of his guitars after a, a, an ex-girlfriend that stole a guitar. So he named the next one after her. And I was like, that's classy. That's cool. I like that. And th there's also <laughs> an interesting aspect here to like, if you've got a 40,000 square foot mansion, it's not hoarding, right? Until you run out of space. But if you've just got a tiny little apartment all of a sudden, if you've got 20 guitars, it looks like you've got a problem. But it's really just because you don't have the same space as someone else, right? <laughs> but in, in, again, in this Brave Little Toaster, they are really drilling home this concept of never throw anything out for any reason. And it just, it makes me, as I'm watching it now, you know, because I'm watching it as a kid, it was just a cartoon and it was interesting. And you kind of bond with the characters going through these like really surreal sort of like nightmare scenarios. But now as an adult that has watched almost every episode of hoarders, you know, through all the different seasons, it also feels like this particular <laughs> brave little toaster series and perhaps toy story, they kind of like feed into the creation of more and more hoarders and it and i think i don't know i don't have any proof i uh, looking up in the original author but the original author is a guy named thomas m dish and uh, i think i'm pronouncing that right and i feel like a lot of that dystopian and like hoarder mentality especially as they bring it out in like these dystopian novels it gets fueled by the original like great depression and a lot of like the stories of the great depression that maybe they would have grown up with around their parents or grandparents because uh, and that's partly too of just watching all the hoarder episodes where a lot of the time they they drill it into and it and it starts with people that had everything taken away or had to like sell everything or or had to live for an extended amount of time without any resources and then once you know they actually have the ability to start collecting stuff or buying stuff they begin to hoard it so I feel like yeah Brave Little Toaster and Toy Story sparked like a, a new little ignition of of hoarding and pro-consumerism and um there actually are more tangled webs uh between this and toy story than you know looking at the production and, and i'm just reading straight from week here the rights to the book were acquired by walt disney studios in 1982 john laster then employed at disney wanted to do a computer animated film based on it but was turned down so it ended up with a different company i guess you know the Disney's involvement has to do with they still have the rights and, and stuff, but they decided not to do it on their own, basically. But you lasted her. So this could have been on the to first this. Toy Story. It's not far off. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the first things that really hits me. Um, I guess toys are more lovable. I mean, I mean, Pix look at Pixar. Their symbol is a lamp, right? Their first actual CG was with a lamp. So, Oh, and it, and it really does look very close to the lamp in Brave Little Toaster. Yeah, it's a different color, but otherwise it's quite similar. So I mean, the, the, you know, I'm just saying the, the DNA of these two are actually a little more closely entwined than it would, would seem at first. Like Laster wanted to make this and lost the chance and did it himself you know several years later basically the, uh, it would have been weird to see the 3d version of this one i think disney did a good job in switching over to toy story for just purely commercial reasons i think it has a lot much longer shelf life than this one does and there was another one too and th i don't know if this one predates brave little toaster i feel like it was 80s but I think it was called the Christmas story or something. It was a Jim Henson production. And the concept was that when all the humans left this room, all the toys came to life. And then you weren't allowed to be seen by a human. Otherwise you would like freeze in position forever. It was almost like a, like the, a true death you would meet. <laughs> uh, but I always, they always freaked me out this concept that when you leave the room, like everything that you own might be alive. And that if you catch them off guard, 
you know, you could kill them or or you might like see part of their magic and then they talk to you. Then they become your friends like, mm-hmm. oh, the jig's up. You know, you you caught us. Uh, yeah, I, so do, I, I do. I remember as a is... kid, like trying to catch my stuff. Yeah. Sorry, what? <laughs> I was saying I do hope the guitar is shred when I'm out of the room. That'd be fun. It has to be <laughs> yeah. shredding though. Yeah, it can't it can't just it can't be like simple strumming. It's gotta be shredding. <laughs> it's it's a weird feeling though about your inanimate objects starting to possess some kind of like soul. And I mean, just jump in head first into the the occult symbolism here. Cause I really when we, when we start this series, right? Some of the movies you have to bend over a little bit backwards. Uh, Bambi's a good one and Fox and the Hound and um, Lady and the Tramp to try and get some sort of like a cult readings into it specifically. And, you know, sometimes it's fun to explore that, but this one, I didn't even have to try this one. It, it almost felt like all three of these movies were beating me over the head with this occult symbolism. Um, so, so one of those examples, they, they state it a little bit clearly in the third movie, but this concept of that, the longer something is next to a human, the human like rubs off on it. And this was, uh, this is going to sound crazy if you haven't seen all three of them. But in the third movie, Toaster Goes to Space, the way that they get the space is that the uh, the hearing aid of Albert Einstein and one of Albert Einstein's colleagues, who's a real person, and this is like cited in the introduction of the, the novella that Thomas Ditch wrote, and he's like, you know, these are all real people and real places and stuff. And so the uh, the hearing aid of Albert Einstein explains the unified field theory to a bunch of, you know, toasters and lamps and vacuum cleaners. And then they use this to travel at like light speed to go to the planet Mars and come back. And they've got like they've built a huge missile that they're aiming at the Earth. Um, but this concept of humanity and the human consciousness rubbing off on inanimate objects so that they start taking on those properties is a very rosicrucian sort of way of thinking and and i haven't seen it applied to inanimate objects but it definitely applies to domesticated animals and i feel like this is like a weird again like this pro transhumanist agenda where it's like just get used to and embrace the concept of machines and hardware and even software they even delineate in the second movie the difference between software and hardware and what a network is and that a network is essentially its own nation of electronics and appliances and computers that can talk in their own language and develop like their own culture and everything and they're basically saying that that has a soul and everything around you has a soul embrace this so actually yeah. i'm going to i'm going to take it in the more old school direction um in japan it's pretty uncommon for a family to move into a new house uh whatever house was there before will be torn down and they'll build a new one relatively cheaply um i'm sitting here it's summer it's pretty hot because japanese uh homes are not well insulated so (laughs) you know they're they're but the idea is you know a family lives in the house for a few decades and they've imbued themselves into that house so no one else would want to live there because their spirit is like infecting the house um a lot of shrines. I mean, you can occasionally find a very old shrine, but a lot of shrines are, you know, torn down and rebuilt every once in a while. For you've for mentioned this reasons. before too, but they it's it's a this weird paradox because they're technically newer than a lot of old places that you'd look at, but they look older because they rebuild them so much closer, and since they do it so much more often, it, I guess it retains what it actually looked like back when it really was new. Which is a, a, such an a interesting concept to me. Exactly. So that would be the, the other side. The other one I just wanted to mention uh, where I first learned about the, the idea of um, inanimate objects having souls or at least some kind of residual human interaction was, was actually from an X-Men comic. So uh, this, <laughs> this, I didn't see the Brave Little Toaster. So this was uh, maybe 1989. It's when the X-Men had... Uh, like fake their deaths and move to Australia and and the X-Men nobody cares about. I don't even think he's been in a movie long shot finds a treasure stash under their, their outback town in Australia and starts realizing that he can like feel the memories of everything he touches in there and it goes about returning the items to the people they are stolen from. But I do remember I was about 10 years old and, and that concept just kind of like blowing my mind at the time, you know, like it barely made sense, but movies like this and of course toy story kind of made that like 
how we all think now. Like everyone kind of assumes their toys are going to like, I got Chewbacca and Rose from star <laughs> Wars up here and, 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 and I'm, I assume they're going to be jumping around on my desk when I leave, you know, <laughs> well, what are those concepts that you mentioned is called, uh, there's a name for it called psychometry and that's not necessarily, uh, inanimate objects coming to life, but the idea that, say vibrations or like a certain tone or energy can get rubbed off on inanimate objects which makes you know like a a location feel creepy or if you know like um whenever they hire the psychics that do the you know the when the cops used to hire the psychics when they they couldn't find anything else and they'd be like you know give me a handkerchief or a piece of their you know clothes or you know like their glasses or whatever and then use that to figure out where they are technically that's like a, a form of psychometry which is like if you just turn if you were like a, a human uh turntable or like a stylus and you could just touch everything and then replay the vibrations that happened around that um, and, and i think this that is, a, is the term they used in that comic i just didn't have psychometry it, like, i think they did it was, use it. i just had my instant recall you know <laughs> it was in uh i've tried trying to find the exact episode i haven't found it yet but the show supernatural i think they have an episode on psychometry where they play like a record but as the record is playing you actually see like almost ghost forms start to show up and then if you like you know skip back and restart it then like that whole 3d sort of reenactment of what happened in that room at that time also gets repeated it was it was a good way of visualizing a, a very abstract concept but but so just to be clear, the uh, that psychometry, that's more of like everything turns into a recording device. But this concept in Brave Little Toaster, and I think it was Christmas Story of and Toy Story of things coming to life, that feels very, very Rosicrucian. Oh, yeah, for, for sure. Um, but, and I, I, you know, I guess I was thinking, watching this, like I was kind of thinking more of, uh, as we often get on with the Gnosticism, you know, I'm always like uh, the ma- this I one mean, is the master, 100%. the master. I mean, I, they give him a name in the sequels, which is now slipped my mind. But I, I like that the first. Yeah, his name I is like- Rob in, in the, the full stories, because the first one doesn't have the name at all. If I'm correct, it's always the master. <laughs> it's just the master. And and I mean, since you already started on that, the movie itself opens up on the sun rising and then it shows the toaster and the toaster shows a reflection of the sun rising. And then even when the toaster and all the appliances in that first movie declare, like, we're going to go and find our master, that's after uh, basically, like, overnight, because as he raises his little flipper hand thing, it's got this big rising sun right behind him as he declares, like, I'm going to go find my master. So all this concept of like reflecting the sun and the sun always rising when they're having these these bouts of bravery and then at night when it goes down they always emphasize with like the crescent moon and the night always brings sort of horror and terror and and disarray within their little group so they really beat you over the head like i was saying it's not a subtle one where this feels like it's a gnostic tale and it might even be like a like um a demiurge sort of tale i don't want to call rob you know jesus in this context because he's just like a kid that has parents and a family as we see but to these little inanimate objects yeah they absolutely venerate him like he was their god the way that they talk about him and it seems that they've just been sitting there for a good 10 years because they we actually never see rob as a um we don't really ever see him as a boy we see flashbacks right but he's he's already eighteen once this gets started. Like uh, I put in my notes several times, we've you know we've gone straight to Toy Story three in this case, uh, as far yeah, as so, so the, the backstory. Well, they they say in the movie that they've been there for two thousand days, um, and then in the books they mention something about like multiple like two years and like they know it down to the the minute almost. And I had to rewatch this and read some of those novellas to to truly understand what the hell was going on here. But basically, it's a cabin. It's just a cabin that Rob and his family would go to every summer. But then once he graduated from high school, he didn't have a reason to go back to, you know, this little summer cabin and instead was like staying in the city and just doing other stuff. So that's the underlying premise. But yeah, when you watch it, it's like, like how long have they been here? Is this an abandoned house that no one's lived in for many years, but it's, it's roughly been in the, the movie context, 2000 days. And they just 
I guess I've been waiting around for Master to come back. They've been going through the motions for forever, which I guess, you know, uh, if you want to make some criticism on religion, you could argue that a lot of ceremony and stuff is just going through the motions. I mean, you know, how many religious people are really feeling it every time? Pro probably few or nobody, at least, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for what I know. I mean, well, it's kind of what a religious action is. I mean, I'm, I'm a strong opinion that even if you don't have what you would call consider religion, if you've got like a set practice that you always do constantly without even thinking about it, I mean, that's kind of turns into a religious uh, practice. Right. You know, it's like I have my own religion. Um, I, I guess, you know, as, 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 as far as I have my own routines and things, right? But yeah, sometimes. Are you tax exempt though? That's the real question. Am I? Oh, I'm not tax exempt, unfortunately. Uh, I think um, you're not a real religion. Ah, uh, damn it! You have to have more than one person in your religion, I guess. But <laughs> I, I guess there is, you know, I have I have like meditation sort of things, and and occasionally it's just like I'm doing it just to keep the routine, you know. And other times, yeah, it's really cool, and you know, like you you experience things that sort of thing. But a very, you know, a, a, there's a lot of times when it's like. Mm, yeah, I'm just doing this to keep the practice. So I, I guess that's true for everything, you know, that that you're serious about. <laughs> well, and and I mean, and harping on that same concept of like religion, and it just turns into empty rituals at some point. You could reread and rewatch Brave Little Toaster as if it were a story of, say, a Masonic lodge that has lost its worshipful master, and they don't know how to basically. Uh, uphold the lodge without him so i've got some quotes directly from the movie so after they uh they mentioned that they've been stuck here for two thousand days just doing chores the, i in my mind this chore it's such a this one's interesting because again it's a cartoon for kids so this brave little toaster is going to be watched by you know preteens and younger essentially so these are the kind of things that shape those little minds and to a little kid, you're not going to be like, hey, you know, the rest of your life is just going to be horrible manual labor. You're going to hate it. So they kind of put these little proxy characters in. And instead of you're going to have to work for the rest of your life as, you know, a blue collar worker, it's like, oh, the appliances have to do chores. And then again, this is like this transference of, oh, I feel bad for my vacuum because we make it do so much. Or I feel bad for my toaster because, you know, I'm, I'm like overusing my toaster. And this this gets emphasized in the second movie where they talk about computers and technology and the Internet, where the computer is basically saying, you know, I get abused by humans all day, but no one cares about that. But the, these are the quotes from that first movie. So and I think that blanket toaster and vacuum kind of represent these three major archetypes. And I also think that they relate to the Aqua Teen Hunger Force characters, which we'll get into a little bit later. <laughs> but I feel like there's direct correlations but you've got Blanket who's scared of doing chores without the master. So this is the person uh, maybe in Lodge or, you know, in, in any other context that that doesn't want to do anything without the master around. So Blanky's saying that and he says, I don't like to work without the master. And he, he says that he's scared of it. Then you've got Toaster saying it'll be fun and turns the radio on and wants to dance and always turn it into a game. And so he kind of feels like this new initiator, like this sort of like overly optimistic one that doesn't necessarily have reality in mind. And then you've got the old curmudgeon vacuum. And his quote was, it's not supposed to be fun, it's work. And that reminds, I mean, I, I feel like everyone knows these three different archetypes in mind. You've got like the old, oh, that's how it's always been done. And that's how we need to do it mentality. You've got the like, get up and go. And then you've got the one that's like, I don't want to do anything without an adult in the room. Um, so I feel like they're they're setting up these like archetypes and again with that brave little toaster being the protagonist and being that representative of like the rising sun and the reflection of the rising sun of uh, you know very visually in this he kind of acts as that person that's like pushing the, the story forward so i don't know i feel like it's, it's just so uh dripping with some of this these archetypes and the, these uh symbols let's not forget phil hartman's ac is the um conspiracy theorist <laughs> That's, yeah, I didn't even get to that. And he, uh, what was his, uh, what was his name? I forgot his name, but he says that, uh, that they're all in on it. And apparently, like the the dynamic here was that the AC is mounted to the wall, so he can't move around like all these inanimate objects can. But also that he was too high off the ground that the master couldn't play with him 
and he's become jaded over the years and he feels that you know everyone's working against him because he never got to interact with anyone um so yeah he's he actually says it's a conspiracy he says the word conspiracy which was pretty awesome i always like seeing that in in uh cartoons commits the worst case of suicide i've ever seen <laughs> <laughs> So, and I got some notes here, just random things. So if they've been doing chores for 2000 days, then what was special on this one day? Um, and I, and I'll answer part of that. They see a for sale sign getting knocked in the front yard, but before they even see that for sale sign, they said they've been doing 2000 days of chores, but then it shows them like wiping dust and cobwebs off of things that clearly hadn't been cleaned for years. So I, I don't know. I just, I won. There's a lot of um like story holes in this whole thing. A lot of plot gaps. Um, well, also that on the previous days. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe they did different chores. Sure. That's, that's part of it. But then another yeah. big one is that Extra the lamp turns. is like turning on and off. The radio's turning on and off. Um, everyone's moving around with no electricity. And then at very convenient parts of the story, it's like, Oh, we can't do anything without being plugged into the wall or, oh i'm like running out of juice and i don't know it, it feels very flippant like sometimes they need to be plugged in sometimes they don't sometimes they can run off battery sometimes they can't yeah that stood out to me because i was trying to work out that logic you know 20 minutes in like, wait, wait. you got to give that one up it just it doesn't make any sense unless they need it for some kind of like plot device where the and... you know the vacuum cleaner is like just rolling through the forest i'm like yeah vacuum cleaner can't do that that's not gonna happen yeah. <laughs> but it can't pick up kitty litter yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean that thing's gonna get jammed and screwed up you know 30 meters down through that forest or something you yeah but so and, um, I, and I got the quote of the AC unit. So he gets into a fight with the vacuum cleaner and the AC unit says, what are you going to do? Suck me to death. And there's a lot of funny <laughs> adult double entendres. Laced oh, yeah, I, I, I did. I did write that quote down. Yeah. OK. <laughs> and then and then and then the AC unit saying, you think I don't know what's going on in here? It's a conspiracy. And every one of you low watts is in on it. And then he says, I'm not an invalid. I was designed to be stuck in a wall. I like being stuck in the wall. And then he literally blows a fuse and explodes. And as they leave him, it's almost like he's he's a goner. Like, you know, he's no longer alive. Um, and it plays kind of like this little creepy music. So it starts off on a really upbeat conspiratorial note. Yeah, they do like to like um go with the, the fear of this thing is destroyed a lot in these movies it's in the first and the second for sure um just like well you know the second one hey i thought they actually did off the radio you know when he makes his sacrifice of his vacuum tube right but uh <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot well see and there's a big jesus complex going throughout these movies um so in this one i feel like they're painting it more towards the master so before they even leave they're saying you know well, he, but I thought he loved us. Why would he leave us? And it just feels like sort of like the the uh, the Christian rhetoric that you hear sometimes when they're evangelizing and talking about Jesus. It's like, you know, why, if the son of God loves us, why did he leave us? Why are we waiting for him to return? And there were just so many correlations. And again, as the, the brave little toaster makes this final speech before they embark out into the world, it shows very clearly in the in the back of him, the sun rising up again, as he's saying, we're going to go find the master, which is how it just has like this very specific language to it. They don't say the boy or the kid or Rob. So it's like one of those uh, Twilight Zone style episodes where this little microcosm universe, you know, looks at this child as their God. Do you think uh, the, the, and to the rescue, do you think having Rob as a pretty major character was kind of a flaw I mean, Toy Story never makes Andy much of a character, right? Maybe the last yeah, scene of three. <laughs> I th the, after the first movie, it turns into an absolute fever dream. And it's weird that they turn Rob and his girlfriend, which then turns into his wife and the main characters. It's it's odd, but um, I, I don't know. I, I like this in the way that I like the room, but only because it goes completely off the hinges. And again, with the context of knowing about planned obsolescence and knowing about, you know, all these weird conspiratorial theories and then knowing that like, let me just uh, go on a, a very tiny tangent here. But again, the author Thomas um, M ditch, 
He's the one that wrote the both novellas that I found, The Brave Little Toaster and Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. And uh, he also has a large library of other books he's written. One of them is called Black Alice, which is a, an adult gritty version of Alice in Wonderland, which takes place in like New York, like grimy New York City. So and it's definitely like an adult read. There's another book that he's got called 334 and 334 takes place in a dystopian downtown New York City in the year 2025. It was written in 72. So, you know, he thought he was writing 50 years in the future. Um, but, you know, we're like we're kind of coming around on that. But the the part that's interesting about 334 is that one, it's a reference to 334 AD, which was when the Roman Empire fell. So there's that dystopian aspect. But then it's comprised of a bunch of little mini stories within it. And those stories... <laughs> One's called Death of Socrates, which is basically about a guy that has a low scoring test in school, so he can't have he's not allowed to have children. Uh, very dystopian. There's one called Bodies, which is about a nurse that moonlights as a body snatcher to a necrophiliac brothel. All <laughs> oh, right. There's a one called um, Everyday Life in the Roman Empire, where um, a, a, basically a government teacher brings their son to school and uses a hallucinogenic assisted role-playing game set in the year 334. Um, there's just like, th there's a, a group of kids, highly educated prepubescent children that decide to commit gratuitous murders in the park. So anyways, this is the same guy that wrote Brave Little Toaster and Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. So if there's any question as to, oh, you might be looking into it or like trying to read into this dystopian. No, like this this guy was very well known even before Disney bought the rights to these stories. Um, he was known for writing this kind of dark dystopian sort of narratives. So I feel like knowing that going in and rewatching Brave Little Toaster, it makes it far more interesting because if you don't do that, it it does feel like it's a movie made for kids, and it can be seen that way. Well, what and I guess it's going to be slightly less body. I was just like, even with the first one, you know, Rob's kind of mildly geeky. I guess that's just glasses or whatever. But uh, yeah, you're like, oh, him and his girlfriend do it, you know? Like that's clear yeah. in the first <laughs> one, which is kind of weird for an animated film because uh, you know, it's like Mickey and Minnie. You don't even, yeah, what are they up to? You don't know. <laughs> well, they have a baby in the third one, which definitely doesn't happen in the novellas. So that's that was another interesting plot device they worked in. Yeah, I uh, one series I like but never watched the third entry of was uh, How to Train Your Dragon, because it starts off with Hiccup the Hero's kind of a geek, uh, his dream works. But um, the second movie is kind of like standing up and becoming a leader. And I was like, okay, a third one, you got to put a Viking beard on him. And they didn't, so I never watched it. <laughs> he needs a viking beard in the third one <laughs> beard, beard gate but it, it is interesting that these characters even more than andy and toy story are kind of allowed to grow up i mean he does i mean he, he he's in the first one it's more like oh i can save money because i already have this stuff at the summer home right it's not i mean there, there's a little bit of nostalgia too of course but it's mo mostly practical where uh kind of although it's it's really strange because he has a modern AV sort of setup, right? Like modern digital with equalizers and all sorts of stuff. But he's holding on to this AM radio that requires a super expensive, rare vacuum tube in order to operate. Um, that's like hard to find. He has to like special order it from Alaska, all to just listen to this AM radio. That okay, fine. Maybe it was given to him by grandpa, or it's got this nostalgic reason to it. But he even gets into a fight with his uh, girlfriend's soon-to-be wife over the vacuum. And first he says, he doesn't do kitty litter. So he refers to the vacuum mm -hmm. as a he. So this clearly shows that Rob is aware, at least, or has created this, you know, like, uh, this soul within the vacuum, that it's a, it's a male character. And then he says, uh, I've had it since I was a kid. I'm really attached to it. And I'm just trying to think, like, how how odd is that that you've got a child that is obsessed with a an old school vacuum to the point where they're yelling at their you know uh their other just because they were using it to vacuum something up you're like no that that vacuum's not meant to be used you know i've got a deep attachment to him leave him alone it just feels weird like i guess you could do it with woody and you could do it with the toys and things that have like faces and arms but this old vacuum cleaner that that one felt strange because yeah, I just did Toy Story 3 where um, 
if you remember, it's basically Woody gets to go off with college because Andy remembers him. The other toys are going off in the attic to be forgotten. Like, like they're going to be up there for 2000 plus days, probably more than 2000 days, you know? It's, right. It's but now imagine message. that like your kid's favorite thing was a vacuum cleaner. I mean, sometimes and like kids... an old ungrounded vacuum cleaner. Do I do know I have a video actually where my daughter was uh, six and we were uh, there was a Roomba running around and she's like trying to direct the Roomba, you know, which is cute. But if she did that a lot, she might have more of a connection to the Roomba. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, of course, Roomba seems, I, I guess, a little more animate because it's a, you know, like a robot. Right. So. So and so here's the other one, too. What about the blanket? This this one I don't understand because it's clearly a, a baby blanket, an electric baby blanket. But the guy still wants it. Rob still wants to keep the blanket. And in fact, in the third movie, they keep using that same baby blanket for their baby, which is, you know, I, I'm Unhygienic. guessing it's at least like 20 years. And mm -hmm. and you see this blankie like walking around on the kitchen floor and the way it walks is it like drags itself. So they're taking this this blanket that's been, you know, unwashed, presumably for over two decades and then just reusing it through multiple babies. And I don't know, it just, this is, I guess, put it under the plot gap category, but it felt weird. Like out of all the things you can salvage, you might buy your newborn baby, a new baby blanket and not the one that you grew up with that has frayed wires and is ungrounded. And I, I, I remember running around with a blankie till I was like six years old or so. Right. I couldn't tell you what happened to that. <laughs> You didn't save so, it and give it to to your baby. <laughs> no, no. Well, she ended up. Um, my wife was wearing like this purple vest, and she ended up like attaching to that and carrying. It, so my <laughs> wife couldn't wear it anymore, right? It was just like, yeah, my daughter would carry that around. Of course, I don't. She probably don't remember it now, or if she does, I mean, I couldn't. She doesn't know where it is, you know. <laughs> I don't think she wants it now. <laughs> it would be weird. It would be weird, but it would be even weirder if it were a vacuum. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and harping on top of the uh, the whole Rosicrucian or occult aspect of it, uh, I I mean I I say fill in the blank Masonic Rosicrucian Gnostic, <laughs> but they after they finally leave the house, which it, it again it's so weird because they have all these false attempts, and the last one is like oh the vacuum's cord isn't long enough, but it's like this was the first time that anyone's needed to be plugged into the wall for any reason up until now everyone's been jumping and dancing and singing and like using you know, turning forest. the light on and off it's all operating off magic and now when they finally want to leave this cabin for the first time now they can't rely on magic now they have to use the 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 rules of the mundane physical world right so they find a car battery i guess it looks like and they sort of jerry rig that and connect that to the vacuum and now the vacuum's got power to drive them all forward which for some reason they couldn't use the magic anymore they don't really explain any of that um but where do they go and they break into a song and it's to a place called the city of light and this is again where those three <laughs> archetypes start coming out so one of them's talking about um having to go through all this hardship for a better life this is like that um, the molding of like the man into the perfect man. And then here's just a, a snapshot of some of the lyrics. Let us meet the master. We don't want to wait, make him wait. You just keep knocking and he will open up the gate to that city of light. And then each of the characters all relate to who they think is this master. So one of them says, master is a man with a plan I can understand. So he can sort of, you know, communicate the world in, in logical statements to these inanimate objects, perhaps. Master is a man of great reflection, as said by the toaster, who again was reflecting the sun and all of the previous scenes when he's talking about the master. Then you've got, this one is weird. Master is a man who lays his hand across the land. Now, in what context does this stupid little nine-year-old Rob uh, match that description in any way shape or form right master is a man who lays his hand across the land it sounds like terraforming it doesn't sound like a nine-year-old and then um, finally master is a man of our affection <laughs> yeah my my note is stop saying master it's killing my soul but uh, <laughs> but, but the, uh, i should note the, the music um I, I my inner beach boys geek has to let it out but uh the music's written by van dyke parks who was uh, 
you know, around the LA scene, you know, maybe a like kind of a Laurel Canyon hanger on in the sixties and wrote the lyrics for uh Brian Wilson's, you know, Beach Boys Smile album, which are fantastic lyrics, but weird. They have like tons of like alternate meetings, you know, alliterations, just uh very, you know, trippy stuff. So when I saw he was doing the songs in a credit, I, I did like spark up a little bit, you know. And the original books, um, there's like old German folklore lyrics that are baked into it, which is interesting. But yeah, one of his big things is trying to do like kind of the like trippy Americana, which I guess kind of comes through here because we have these, you know, like old school appliances that kind of brings you like the old Americana vibe a little bit. Maybe that's why they hired him. I don't know. A little bit of that. And there's also the nightmare uh, sequence, which you know that i i really do feel that this the first of the little toaster movies it kind of shows in my mind the 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 power of animation and how cool animation can make a story because to me as they lead up to this you're just seeing these inanimate objects like run around and dance and jump and it's i mean to me it's not that visually engaging but then one of them goes to sleep and they have this crazy surreal nightmare about like an evil clown and this water that turns into forks that turns into all these different ways that you can off yourself using a toaster and that's where i think these animations get really uh intricate and where it can explore concepts that movies can't and that sometimes just writing can and that's really where it starts to shine so they they do that for just a brief moment in this movie for just like a small little nightmare sequence and then they end up with the uh, salvage guy for a while after that, which it weirdly looks like Rob. I thought maybe we'd actually gone like 20 years since <laughs> he'd been there and, and he'd turned into like this creepy dude, right? Because uh, like, he's called the pirate in the book series. They call that guy the pirate. Okay. But I did find it, it was almost like a red herring Rob, I think. Like I really, for five minutes, was like, oh, is this their previous owner? Is this the master? <laughs> Well, it's definitely not the master. It's just some guy that inadvertently first saves them, but then it almost turns into like a butcher scene right. where he's going to like hack them apart and pull them for spare parts, which to me, this is another one of the plot holes, but the concept of this movie is don't throw your stuff away, keep it forever. And you can even see through the sequence of the, you know, the two different sequels through that trilogy that even rob is known to like repair things and you know get an old vacuum tube out of that thing and put it in this thing and they all venerate him for it but now all of a sudden this guy that owns a second hand shop where it's literally his profession his entire job is to make sure that things keep getting reused and like repurposed and they see that they're use so i don't know it's, it's weird that they paint this guy almost as like a villain as like the scary person because he feels like you know he represents what the moral of this movie or the series is trying to make in a way. Maybe they're saying don't fix it too much or you'll steal its soul. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, it was there, the, the, the ship of Theseus or whatever. I did think one of the most interesting lines, which um, could get to that is we are, we are all just combinations of substance. Again, a very Gnostic vibe there, you know? Um, and then like how much substance does it need to be to be, quote unquote you so maybe that's what we're looking at with someone like the pirates he's, he's taking too much of their substance or recombining it too much i i don't know and he's not being gentle with them that's another vi thing that they visually portray is he has to salvage a motor from a blender and when he puts the blender into a vice he's you know you can see like the pressure on the blender almost looks like it's gonna hurt the blender and and everyone kind of like shrieks in horror a little bit and and hides it, it reminded me a little bit of that movie with seth rogan where like the grocery store goods are like tur it turns into like a horror movie because he starts chopping up you know carrots and produce and stuff and they all start screaming um i always <laughs> always thought that would be a cool snack if they could find a way to make a snack that when you eat it it screams like a little gummy bear that would like make noises if you if you chop the head off um there's i well with this podcast out on oral hygiene where i was looking at educational films i never did this one because it's only three minutes long but there's a, a scare film about um about lsd where the 
the girls talking about, you know, being on Sunset Boulevard and buying a hot dog and the, the hot dog's like screaming at her as she tries to eat it. I've got a wife and kids <laughs> and she has a picture back, which it's like, you know, the ketchup seemed like hair and it, it shows like a troll in a bun, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she was and, trying to eat like a plastic troll. And it, well, she was, try, she was on ass and eating the hot dog, but she heard the hot dog screaming. So in the end, I think she throws the hot dog on the ground and runs away screaming. So uh, I do think you should show that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's a, that's a good, you know, that sounds like a fun trip, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we should get to the, the apocalyptic, Thisness. is that a word that's not a word of the um of the dump of the city dump scene and 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 how that really again parallels very much with toy story three i i found it interesting that they were having people singing or cars singing the song and as soon as their line is as soon as they're finished singing their line they're you know turned into a tiny cube of metal by the the chomper machine <laughs> that's the turning in cube Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Let's do that. Don't yeah, matter. because it, it was kind of blowing my mind just how small they were. Which I don't know. I I haven't. I don't hang out in dumps, so I, maybe that is how it works. But yeah, they were little perfect cubes, like you're saying, right? So it seemed. Like which I again, expected... if you take that Masonic uh sort of concept here, where they say that in order to get to perfection, you have to go through all this trial and struggle, and then at the end, they're showing you these perfect little cubes yeah i mean it feel it feels like there's a little bit of occultism in there and and i want to mention too that there's a, a sequence that gets them to the dump because they don't go right from outside of the dump they actually find that they they get to the second hand shop and the second hand shop by the way is probably the coolest scene in the movie because it it starts out with that nightmare the surreal nightmare with clowns and a house catches on fire and basically the little toaster kills the family that's kind of what's happening off screen he kills the family because he catches on fire and the smoke rises up and it and it grabs rob and it like yanks rob out of the room and in the book um this actually happens where the toaster sets on fire because someone put an english muffin in it then they didn't trim off the edges and it caught fire and that's why the toaster originally gets somewhat decommissioned a little bit, but they animate this part. And then again, it goes into like first a fork, um, like the clown sprays water and the water turns into these like thousands of forks and the forks are trying to stab themselves into the toaster, which is like a common, you know, way that people would off themselves. And then if you're wondering, Oh, or is this like, you know, just a coincidence then it shows the toaster hanging above a bathtub full of water and it's like okay so clearly they're showing all the ways that you can like weaponize a toaster and um and then when he wakes up that's when they're in this the second hand shop and they find that their way there but in that second hand shop it turns into like a horror movie a b horror movie homage where one of the lamps ends up playing i can't remember his name off the top of my head is the same uh actor that ren from ren and stimpy would always be a caricature of um, the guy that's got that, you know, that Ren and Stimpy voice. Um, but he he becomes like the ringleader of all of these freaks and and sort of like captured, kidnapped appliances that are living in the secondhand shop. And then for some reason, they all decide to band together and break out and they get a big refrigerator to knock down the door and they run out and they make it all the way to the master's house. Um, but when they get to the master's house, the master's got all this new equipment and the new equipment feels like they're now threatened that if the master allows all this old equipment to come back into his life, then he's not going to use the new equipment anymore. And this start, this starts to paint this concept of that your inanimate objects and like all of your, your goods and your things, the more you use them, the more you kind of like put your human consciousness into them so that they're constantly fighting for your attention because the more that you invest energy into these things, the more life you give them. So I guess they're like in a constant war over your attention. Um, so you're so I, don't know, the, I, I uh, thought that was an interesting dynamic. You're saying that Rob has a crush on his reel to reel machine. The reel to reel machine <laughs> is very saucy in this movie. And they almost show like as the reels are turning, it looks like little tassels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, again, a little weird in a kids movie. Creative, I like it, but I'm like, yeah, it's that. Okay, a, yeah, good. sexualized reel to reel machine. Yeah, yeah. So much disco that that was cool. But and in order for um in order for 
the radio to gain access to Rob's adult apartment, he has to know a secret appliance knock. Um, and he does this like secret knock on the door, which lets the appliances know, oh, this is a guy that's in the club. And when the appliance opens the door to him, he makes this line. It, it just sounds so Masonic. It, I don't think it's a Masonic saying, but he says, Terry not upon our doorstep. And then they like enter. And it just felt like that's the kind of thing you would hear after you did like a secret knock. You know, the door opens and it creaks open. Well, Terry not upon our doorstep. And then they come that, in. That was the practical reason for for that right the idea that you would travel to a different town and you'd already have your in because you're a mason and you know you know so even if they're a stranger you already exactly yeah exactly that, that was the radio letting them know like hey i'm on the level tap 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 to tap tap and they do that in the upcoming movie in roger rabbit that's the same thing right it's the the shaving a haircut to bits um that's bit. the speakeasy version but yeah yeah same, yeah i mean the same idea for sure same concept yeah yeah and um, but yeah, that goes very Toy Story three, where they do end up accidentally ending up in the dump truck and accidentally ending up on the way to hell. I felt this one was actually more disturbing because you are seeing all these cars eat it while they're singing. I mean, you miss and the they're singing on worthless. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're missing the visceral hellfire we get in Toy Story three, but or, or or furnace fire, I guess I should say. But um, this one did seem a little more disturbing in the end because of that. I thought. When, and all the cars are singing about like their lives and all the great things they did. There's like an indie car that's like, I've won races and, you know, everyone wanted to be me. And now I'm just worthless along with everybody else here. And I'm, you know, headed out to, to my death in these last days. And there was one, I don't know if you caught this one. There was a convertible that says, uh, the, and they're all singing. This is like a song about being worthless and dying. And one of the guys, one of the cars says, I drove a surfer to the sunset. There were bikinis and buns there with weenies that Fellini could just never forget. And Fellini had to be a reference to the Italian director that made a lot of like B horror slash. I think he, he did a movie about Rome as well. That was not necessarily Caligula level, but it was pretty saucy for the time that it came out. So anyways, there's another interesting connection between Thomas M. Ditch and the fall of Rome and now Fellini somehow. <laughs> I got to cite your film history a, a bit, and I should know the name. Of in the movie. middle of a, a children's just, animation, Roma? yeah. Maybe it's just Fellini's Roma. I don't, I don't quite remember. So Roma, I, yeah, that, that that was one of the the big ones. Yeah, um, but yeah, that that whole scene was definitely a little more visceral. You know, you have a catchy tune again. I I like the guy. He's I, I will say Van Dyke Parks is is strength is probably more as a lyricist because his songs are. Kind of that rant. Well, again, like Toy Story, like Randy Newman, just kind of butter, 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 boop, you know that sort of thing. But Ra he, Randy Newman's got it though, man. Like he can just sing about anything randomly, and it and it sounds like a well produced song to me. <laughs> yeah, I hope maybe that's how he rocks his party. He just sits down and what one of my favorite SNL skits is way back in the day. I think it's maybe he's even supposed to be playing McCartney, but it's Dana Carvey sitting down trying to write a song about broccoli and. <laughs> Chop and broccoli, which I, I you know, I, that still bops in my head every once in a while. I, I still I, like the the Doug um fake band called the Beats. We'll every get to that. I, I don't know that one. So Doug's first movie. We is... will because Doug Doug gets uh consumed by the uh the, the all encompassing Disney at some point. So we yeah will yeah watch Doug, that. Doug's first movie is on the list. So <laughs> it's coming. So sh sh let's let's get into the second and third movies. I've got some brief notes on them. They're they're crazy. The second movie is even longer than the first one. And then the third one is, I think it's about the same length. It's like an hour and 14 minutes. I did find it interesting that the second one um, had so much like early internet stuff because 97 is the year I started like properly using the web. Uh, before that, I'd been on like your prodigy or whatever, but uh, American this online. This movie but... felt like a tutorial a little bit. Like it felt like they had some infographics. So they were, they were teaching you about how technology worked or they were teaching kids how technology worked in this particular movie which was strange to me yeah yeah and that definitely in a, like i could see that happening in like 2003 but being like this early I, I guess it was a little forward thinking and uh you know you get the question is there an agenda i'm like well i guess this one is an agenda they want kids to use the internet for for better or for well, worse well not just use the internet but 
but respect it as its like own living entity. And again, like what they did in the first movie, now instead of just putting a soul into your appliances, like, not just your toaster that has a soul, but now it's the software in your computer. The software has a soul. The hardware has a soul. When you link those up together and form a big network, and it shows all this visually, that now that that network becomes its own nation. They literally say that, that the in internet is building its own nation and that it has its own soul amalgamated from all these different appliances. So I don't know. There, there's some... You can read really deep into this one, in my opinion. I mean, that's pretty and accurate I don't know if it was, at this point. The internet it's is very its accurate. It's very nation, prophetic. Basically. So... <laughs> And there's there's a I I was able to take some screenshots while I was watching this one. So the the premise for the second movie is that Rob has now gone off to college. He's getting his master's or his doctorate or something, and he wants to become like a veterinarian, I guess, or he's like moonlighting as a veterinarian. But in order to graduate college, he has to turn in his final thesis or his doctorate or whatever this big long paper that he's been working on. It's like five hundred pages. And I actually took a screenshot of one of the frames where he's um, writing his conclusion to this long paper. And I just thought it was interesting. I'm, I'm going to read the little bit of the screenshot. So this is Rob's research work. It is therefore my firm belief that animals indeed have memories and experience emotions which could only be described as human, as evidenced in the Ridger study on private receptively human failure. Um, and subsequent increase in serotonin reuptake inhibition. Study delineates propensity for private empathy for human um, and Barris. And then he's like still typing out that last word. But I mean, I, I take this as that Rob is actually doing research on how human interaction with animals and in my mind, proxy inanimate objects that that just rubs off on them. And they emphasize this same concept in the third movie, that just the human being around things and talking about certain concepts over and over, that those actually rub off onto the objects and the animals that they're around. So I, this, say, I mean, it, it feels the like it's a theme. The trees. Or they, I'm missing the forest for the trees a little bit then, because he's obviously living in this environment and, and missing that. So, <laughs> well, yeah, he has no idea that like all of these inanimate objects are working like along with him and for him. And he's just looking at it like they're these animals that he's helping. He doesn't even realize it's the, in the inanimate world that's also needing his help. What is, you know, it's like when you create something, how much uh, is, is, how much is you, how much of you is creating that? all of it? How much of 100%. something else? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, all original, know, always, always original. But, you know, like people talk about writing and channeling, but I think to a certain extent, it, like even if you're just writing your diary entry, there's a certain aspect of that coming in because you're, you know, some of it's unconsciously just words coming on the page. You don't even think about it as you write them. Music, you know, musicians are notorious for saying, I don't know where this melody came from or something, you know, or they I don't, don't They know. don't want to admit they sold their soul to the devil and it's the demon that's doing all the music for them. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, I mean, my personal thing is I, I when I used to write my own lyrics, I, I wrote a bunch of songs 10 years ago, explaining concepts that I didn't learn about for five years after that, you know, right. so then when I went <laughs> back and listened, whoa, <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. How did I write about it? You know, so may, maybe that was it my, sounded cool. <laughs> it did sound cool. Yeah. But <laughs> but that's kind of my point. Like, you know, maybe these inanimate. Uh, if we do want to accept the premise of the toaster verse, uh, then the computer I'm writing it on, the machines I'm using, the instruments I'm using would would have an influence, right? Correct. Just just you being near them. And that's in the third movie. That is the whole reason why the other um, hearing aid decides to build a rocket to blow up the earth is because that hearing aid wasn't used by Einstein. It was used by one of Einstein's associates, but that that guy was always reading about bombs and explosions and like all of this sort of uh, military warfare oriented stuff. So that's, that's why he also, that hearing aid becomes hell bent on just blowing things up because he was around that influence his whole life. It's almost like we should have waited for Oppenheimer to come out before talking about this. But uh, <laughs> <We should>. yeah. <laughs> so, and then th the second movie, it's so weird, man. There's so many, there's so many things going on. So, Rob also has an 
a guy that works with him at the veterinary hospital that's like 10 years his senior but he also goes to college with him it's it's weird um but he's like clearly this much older slimier sort of like new york guy i think at one point he even goes like hey i'm walking to you he says that to somebody so you know he's like this slimy you know new york dude and he's like hitting on rob's girlfriend he's um trying to sell rob's laboratory animals or like his like saved animals he's trying to sell them back to the lab where they got saved from like he's the ultimate super villain in that in that case and he's just doing it to mess with rob and to make like a small amount of money apparently so that there's this weird uh sort of dynamic on that and then there's this dynamic of like i was saying before the machine there's so there's a virus going on in this mainframe of the basement of the building he works at it gets complicated and the mainframe somehow also regulates the power to the building and it gets a virus so while it, the mainframe has a virus the power flickers and when the power flickers rob loses his paper that he's been working on that he just finished writing these 500 pages. And because of that power flicker that was caused by the virus, all of the appliances band together and they need to basically restore, do like a forensic restoration of Rob's paper. And they actually do this exact thing by going and meeting the mainframe, find out that the mainframe has a vacuum tube that he shares with the radio so the radio takes the vacuum tube out of himself here's that sacrifice storyline again right he gives up his life for rob and when they take the vacuum tube and they put it into the back of the mainframe it like magically repairs itself like all the broken bulbs start fixing <laughs> themselves the what like the frayed vacuum wire fixes magical. itself it, yeah it, it, it completely turns magic and you can even see like these little uh, virus like um, space invader looking gremlins inside the machine all just start going away. And it almost looks like a little space invaders game. So that was showing that him replacing this uh, extremely rare vacuum tube it eliminated everything. It fixed all the other vacuum tubes. It fixed the wire. It cleaned out the, the virus. And then the mainframe's able to convey the concept of networking to the audience. And and there's also a really strange um, point in here where it says, oh, wow, the like there's the computer and the computer looks like he's starting to have an orgasm. And the mouse is talking to the computer and the mouse is like, well, what's going on? And the computer says, wow the mainframe is searching through all my files and then they cue this like sexy saxophone music and he says oh he's searching regions um only heretofore dreamed of by man oh that feels good my memory banks are being stroked by an expert i feel something and happening inside of me and i can't keep it to myself any longer and then he starts shooting out papers from the printer which is rob's uh sort of like 500 page document but this whole sequence of like that sexualized mainframe like reaching into the computer's memory banks and stroking them and the computer basically ejaculates this stack of papers uh i don't know it felt like it felt fever dream area for sure to me yep weirdly horny for a kid's movie um <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, again, you got you got the older college guy hitting on his girlfriend, and and like I said, it's it's you know th this does not feel like a um, well, I don't want to say wholesome, but yeah, it, it feels like a properly college level relationship, I guess, which does again doesn't come through in an animated movie. Something I did like about the first more is it not really having a villain, whereas the other ones do, which I guess that's just screenwriting one hundred and one. But I, I did like the fact that the first one, I mean the the villain in the first one is just like destruction right like the idea of destruction is the main villain and abandonment is, an, the, is the other big one right but it's not personified in anything to speak of right i mean you got you have yeah jealous and it feels appliances. clunky in the second one there's also a lot of very heavy exposition like within the first minute it's like oh hey i'm a rat and there's this cat over here and the cat's name is this and she's got three kittens and they haven't opened their eyes yet and like I don't know. It, it just it feels very much like here's the cast. Let me just tell you all the cast names as we go. We're in the first movie. I don't even think you know that the kid's name is Rob until very late or maybe even into the later movies. Yeah, so I think they kind of like one. organically named them. Yeah, exactly. it felt it felt way different. Like the second movie, I was saying, but when we first started this, that 
the brave little toaster to the rescue feels like the Super Mario Brothers 2 of the franchise, where like Super Mario 2, it's got the characters uh, and it kind of has like, you know, the the aesthetics a little bit, but it just feels like it was a completely different thing that got repurposed. Um, which is sort of you know what That's Super Mario exactly Brothers what 2 happened. was. Yes, yes. It's exactly what happened. But it, but that feel is sort of applied to this brave little toaster. So I don't know if that's a side effect of just having two teams go off and like work on the same thing at the same time. Um, but yeah, that it felt weird. Like there was definitely something more Saturday morning cartoonish to this to this one. I honestly felt a little weirder on the third one, maybe because we left Earth, right? You know, we're getting in like well, the third one territory. The third one wasn't even made for people living in just like normal sober reality, I don't think. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, because I felt like we were fully getting to like starlight barking territory with that. Yeah, oh no, yeah, hundred like, percent, man. Which, you know, unfortunately never happened with the with the Dalmatian. So we get it with the toaster. So I guess that's cool. Well, but I I think I don't know if I didn't tell you, but there is a movie called Good Boy that is directly based on oh, yeah, the Starlight Barking. That. Yeah, yeah. But I tried not... watching it. It's it was not an easy watch. I haven't made it all the way through. I mean, it's it's really bad. It's like Wishbone bad. Uh, no, no offense, Wishbone. <laughs> it didn't get enough bad votes to end up on my podcast where we do the bad movie. So it turns out that the list I'm using, you have to get ten thousand bad votes first. So. <laughs> before that no good so um, let's do the mars one the mars yeah, one yeah. is definitely my favorite okay interesting because that's the i thought i'd be into it uh the voice of tony a tiger that's the last movie he did i believe that's kind of a, a fun fact um but yeah that was like i maybe it was just because it was getting too late at night and i had to go to bed and i like wanted to get through it quickly but yeah <laughs> Well, the, the concept is mind-blowing to me. It's got space communism. It's got anti-consumerism. Again, they talk about the planned obsolescence and all of this, like, psychometry stuff. Um, and then from the, the actual novella that it was based on, again, the, it was a novella called The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. And this is what Thomas Dish writes in the opening to it. Uh, and this is just some of it. But it says, some parts of this book are fiction, but Albert Einstein really did invent and patent a hearing aid with his friend Rudolf Goldschmidt and even wrote a poem to him about the collaboration. He also took out a patent on a refrigerator. That is all true. Uh, and then he talks about where you can find that all this was, uh, you know, were written about. And then he says the name Populux was coined by the writer Thomas Hine, who wrote a whole book called Populux, uh, which he explains what he means by it. But in the book, they named this set of appliances Populux. Um, and in the movie, they call it Wonderlux, but it's essentially the same thing. And the idea here is that Wonderlux is created by this evil engineer who purposefully plans obsolescence into all of the technology. So he makes basically a bunch of ovens and refrigerators that are Apple guaranteed products. to break after. Yeah, Apple products <laughs> that are just guaranteed to break after a certain amount of usage. And that the these inanimate objects after gaining consciousness they discover that their entire point of being is to be you know subpar and eventually break and this causes them no you know undue amount of pain and suffering and they decide that if humanity created us to be broken then we're going to break humanity and that's when they create this huge missile and they aiming at planet earth and they're going to use it to take us out and in the book that's pretty much what happens is that the radio figures out that they're doing this plot and they have to go to mars and convince the supreme commander of mars not to shoot a missile at the planet earth and to save humanity um in the movie they spin that a little bit around where now all of a sudden rob and his wife have a baby and the baby accidentally gets beamed into outer space and now they have to go and save the baby and uh, as you might expect from these kind of storylines, the baby like touches the big evil Supreme Commander, thereby through the power of osmosis, almost giving this inanimate object that human spirit again. And then he's like, oh, I forgot what human spirit felt like. OK, I don't want to kill humans anymore. Uh, we're good now. So that's sort of the whole premise. But within all of that, these concept of like communism comes out. And this is where the third movie feels like it takes this huge departure from the first two because in the first two it's all about never throw anything out 
you know, your blanket that you grew up with as a baby has all this soul in it. So you can never get rid of it. Otherwise you're hurting it. But in the third movie, they make this case of like, yeah, but even if we go back to the planet earth, they're going to be inventing all this new technology that's going to put us out of date. And then humans are going to discard us eventually. And then one by one, each of the characters admits this. And even the vacuum is like, yeah, we're all going to get discarded. But as long as you were useful during your life, then it's not such a tragedy. And then they're all like, and it, it feels very like a um, communist in, in a way of like, at, as long as you fill your service and you filled your role to society, then we can just grind you out to the bone. But you should be happy because you provided for society. You met um, your quota. They, Per quota. And and honestly, they they really drive this home, this this whole entire concept that that's the society that they all want to kind of work towards. Yeah, yeah, I can say I was also just sitting here thinking of the um, the Star Trek, the motion picture concept where, you know, Voyager comes back to try and retouch its creator, you know, again, well, trying and to I beat like the you... master. And you brought that up and they actually say prime directive in this movie. So when, when they first, before they go out to outer space, the blanket is like, what, you know, what are we supposed to do? Like, what's the point of life essentially? And that's when they say, well, have you ever heard of prime directive? And even the blankies like, what's prime directive? It's a, we got to grab that little quote for something. And then they explain to him what a prime directive is. And I guess his prime directive is to keep the baby comfortable. Um, but yeah, so so there's a, definitely a Star Trek link in here by just calling it that a few times. But but uh, yeah, I guess just think it's basic because you know the real Voyager probes. Who knows what if they achieve sentience and get angry and turn around, see what happens. <laughs> It'd take them a good forty years to get back. <laughs> and and there's some weird science in this one too. Like for example. Only the inanimate objects can go to Mars because there's no oxygen in space. So now like the rat and the cat and the snake and all the animals that were in the second movie, they can't come along for this ride. Um, so that's so I don't know, it, it felt interesting. It's like, oh, like you can be magical and you can come to life as an inanimate object. But if you're an organic being, you can't survive in space. There's no oxygen. What are you crazy? You know, the science doesn't no check oxygen. out for that. Yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, here's a here's a lamb singing to you uh, and dancing. <laughs> yeah, not um, when you're looking though. <laughs> and then as they go up and up, they run into like a bunch of balloons, which was a strange and also part of the book. But I guess like right as you get towards the Van Allen belt. All the balloons that children have let go of in parks, and there's a, a balloon from Woodstock. It's like a hippie balloon that's clearly stoned and kind of talking like Bob Dylan. And then there's like a, a redneck kind of rodeo balloon that got let go from a rodeo. So all of these balloons that children have let go of since forever are still intact, and they're still floating just outside the Van Allen belt. And in the movie, they just kind of have like an interesting little song sequence and then they crash into Mars and they're kind of uh, non sequitur. But in the book, the balloons actually help push them through the Van Allen belt. So like they're they're more vital to the story in the written version than in the movie version. Yeah, it should take 2000 days to get to Mars once you're out of the Van Allen belt. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then uh, when they finally get to Mars, Mars is described as just another big junkyard, but this is a junkyard for satellites and for all of those appliances um, that basically were planned obsolescence. They're, they all found their way onto Mars, and we've got another conspiracy theorist in this movie, which is the Viking 1 satellite, and he's a conspiracy theorist because he realized that the media and NASA had always planned from the beginning to send him out into outer space and never let him return. So that was like his big aha moment. And um, this is where it gets, this whole movie is complete fever dream area. But once it starts dropping this on you, I was like, okay, I'm just on, I'm just in for the ride at this point. So they meet the Viking one satellite, who's a conspiracy theorist and calling out fake media and NASA lies. And then the Viking one is is basically commanded slash run by Tin Selena. And Tin Selena was the top or a topper to a Christmas tree that was put inside of the Viking one by some unknown kid at NASA. And because of that, Tin Selena talks about nothing but Christmas. 
Merry Christmas. Well, uh, they got Santa Claus versus the Martians, right? I've seen that. <laughs> I feel like they were just trying to make this movie have a couple like quotable clips so they could market it at like Christmas time. It's like, oh, it's the Brave Little Toaster Christmas movie. You can do this, Die Hard and Prometheus. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Prometheus is a Christmas movie. I know. That's why I'm bringing it up <laughs> as such. <laughs> no, I'm. I've, and, I've... and and this one, I just wanted to throw out here. This definitely um, piqued my ears a little bit for for the occult Disney aspect. But in the second movie, the company that the evil roommate slash veterinary assistant was sending these animals to was called Tartarus. Um, you know, like like the bull Tartar um, and and Taurus. So that was the name of the lab company. And then in the third movie, the uh, the tractor beam that basically pulls them onto Mars is called Noctis Labyr Labyrinthius, which basically means like the night labyrinth. And the labyrinth at the center of it has that minotaur, the bull. So I don't know. I feel like there's there's all of these like Latin references to, you know, bulls. Um, throughout this and even in the first movie everything's good until the night comes and the very first night you've got this bad storm with wind and lightning so it feels like there's this battle of like the storm god and the sun god going on in like a very subtle context there yeah okay so i guess her toaster is as is sunny as we've been saying <laughs> yeah we didn't I talk think so. about um i guess the last thing sorry just spiral spiraling back to the first movie just for a touch uh and you said you looked at a novella where the the climax or of the movie is the dumpster, right? Or the uh, the dump, which is kind of midway through. And the toaster doesn't really make his sacrifice so much in the book. He just kind of blows up. Uh, right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, because the 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 story again in the movies they they try to tie in these archetypes and like the little character arcs a little bit more than the novella because the novella was this slightly dystopian almost sarcastic feeling um short story about this brave toaster and arguing about like brand names and stuff and it it also they try to tie it into like civil rights movements and again like the communist thing where they're talking about uh power to the appliances and like down with the oppressors and the oppressors being humans that are using them which also gets harkened in the second movie where the computers complain about being abused constantly and they make a point um where they they say it's something like oh don't you feel bad and this is in the context of why doesn't the computer just automatically back up the file and they they blame rob for not saving a backup and they're like these stupid humans all you got to do it takes like two nanoseconds to hit save and get a backup and it's not my fault if you know your backup fails and you lose it all and one of the appliances, like, don't you feel bad? And they make this joke of like, well, that's the best part is like, we, we haven't been programmed with guilt. Um, <laughs> so I feel like there's that is like in the background of these movies, too, where they're showing how technology becomes less and less personal and it's like developing its own thing. Technology doesn't care. Yep. You, if, if you want your appliances to love you, they need to be analog. Um, <laughs> I mean, we all know our computers hate us. Actually, shout out to Toshiba. I'm, the computer I'm talking to you on has is, is been going for 13 years. So there's, there's this movie wanted me to rewatch Ghost in the Machine again, too. <laughs> the anime one, I hope. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, am I am I saying that wrong? There was a uh, Ghost in the Machine is an anime, but there was also like a cheesy B yeah, horror I, movie. Is that that was also called Ghost in the Machine, right? Oh, uh, uh, maybe because there was a remake of I mean, there's the Scarlett Johansson. Yeah, not no, not the action. anime, but there there was like a 90s horror movie where basically like a convicted serial killer gets electrocuted but during the time of electrocution he like jumps into the city's power grid and then he like will jump into your microwave or your garbage disposal and, and kill you through it that's not Wes Craven's shocker no okay but that, that also that's a very similar one as well <laughs> yeah yeah sorry that's what came to mind there I, I think I actually have seen the one you're talking about like in the 90s and have long since forgotten about it but now, now 1993 that you're yeah okay because I, I think I remember the anime being like hey is that the same thing and it's not but now the anime is in everyone's mind so we've maybe forgotten about that one <laughs> um I guess we should start wrapping up do you have any final points you want to throw out for the toasters or, or weird background info 
Um, well, we already we already covered all of the weird sort of dystopian science fiction that the guy worked on. Um, and then there was also this weird note that in the stories, they don't explain exactly how the science works of getting from Earth to Mars and then from Mars back to Earth. But in the movie, they basically hamstring together the microwave with organic material, quote unquote. And then that is somehow driving the, the propeller of a ceiling fan, which is then attached to a laundry basket. So you've got laundry basket, ceiling fan, microwave with popcorn in it originally. And that's what allows them to travel at the speed of light to get to Mars and back within the span of like under 10 hours. That checks um, out. But on on the way back, <laughs> Tinselina performs the ultimate sacrifice when they realize they're going to run out of rocket fuel in the microwave rocket and sauce. since yeah they, they ran out of rocket sauce and they need organic material and she's like well my hair is made out of human hair so she donates her human hair as the final fuel and she she's embarrassed by this because now it's like this bald doll but it was just this weird like final act of sacrifice of like take my human hair and they put it into the microwave and they microwave her human hair and they use that to get from mars back to the earth i glad feel like there's way more symbolism in that that i could unpack yeah glad this one's not in smell of vision <laughs> <laughs> human hair in a microwave is not going to be a pleasant odor <laughs> but, um, and, and the third one ends with the wife saying to rob one thing i learned from you never throw anything away so again it feels like that hoarder mentality is being kind of perpetuated by this entire story sequence. Come on, millennials, be pack rats. Yeah. <laughs> Don't throw out grandpa's old uh, AM radio. Mm. Listen to the static. There's another Twilight Zone episode. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess we'll we'll wrap up for today. What's what's going on in your universe mid July? Oh uh, well, I mean, we've got the paranoidamerican.com is probably throwing at least two different Kickstarters. There's the Chosen One issue two, and also nasacomic.com. You go there, it'll either bring you to the Kickstarter now, or if you're listening to this in the future, and I'm talking to you from the past, the nasacomic.com will just bring you to where you can get the published book of Stanley Kubrick directing the moon landings. It's a uh, around 50 pages standalone anthology of really awesome animation, which again was also inspired a little bit by like that Ren and Stimpy um, kind of Klasky Supo animation style. All right. As for this one, it's a cult Disney. You can find us as such on Twitter if it's still there, which I, I guess it's kind of still there these days. Um, <laughs> uh, and Patreon, we're podcast, podcast, yes, where you can get episodes early and you can hear us talk about good movies and bad movies on films and filth, the Twilight Zone on Time Enough podcast. And video game podcasts, Luke Loves Pokemon, Hyrule Field Report about Zelda, and the Game Game Show, Game and Gamers about the games. All righty. So, yeah, I guess next up is Roger Rabbit, which I was almost like, I'm, I'm not going to say disappointed, but I was like, oh, I got to do a brave little toaster first. I'm, I'm ready for the rabbit. We can talk, and um, That might have soured you on on the uh, the third movie of Brave Little Toaster, too. Yeah, I want to get to the it's, rabbit. It's nowhere good as Roger Rabbit. Uh, and maybe I'll send along some clips of Charles Fleischer that will disturb you. And yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about those there. We'll talk about those next time. Okay. Bye y'all. Actually, I will send you those clips. Um, but recently I've come across cause Charles Fleischer did Roger Rabbit and then kind of fell off the face of the planet. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's apparently kind of difficult to work with. Um, you know, he was on set in a rabbit costume to be covered <laughs> later and and bob hoskins apparently did not like that <laughs> he was annoyed but uh the two clips there's i think it's the disney world 25th anniversary includes charles fleischer playing basically every employee at the park like at different scenes and um the even weirder one is it's have you ever, okay have you ever heard of cybermania 94 hmm I don't think so. It's a two hour special that was on TBS. And it um it was like a award show for video games in nineteen ninety four, hosted by I think the kid from Home Improvement and Leslie Nielsen. And uh 
one of the okay. pre- one of the presenters about halfway through is Charles Fleischer, who just goes through it like you don't know what his actual voice is. So he keeps changing his voice. And like most of the voices he uses is problematic. Like a lot of the time it sounds like he's trying to talk to you like this, like 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 a gangster or something. What are Hell you doing, yeah. Charles? It's just like really bizarre. You might actually end up watching this whole two hour special. It's it, it, it wouldn't be unsurprising. Uh, did, did you find it? I, I, I'm looking at the IMDb for it right now. I can see it's on YouTube. Yeah, there's like a two hour one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got the it's got the um commercial. They didn't edit the commercials, which. In 1994, it would have been annoying, but in 2023, it's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that funny how that works? Yeah. So, now I uh, see like an old SpaghettiOs commercial, and it's like, oh, this is that content I needed. Right, because I, I was watching some SCTVs online that were, um, it seemed they'd been videotaped, like in Florida. I think they have a lot of West Palm Beach uh, ads. And you, you always see like a little clip where they edited the commercial. Every once in a while, you watch an episode where they didn't edit out the commercials, and it's like, oh, yeah, this is gold. And for SCTV, it barely even like rates. You know, it's like it feels like the show's continuing because the commercials are so <laughs> weird at this point. Like they just fit the SCTV vibe, so they don't even bother. I, I miss some of those commercials so much too. There was like a very specific '90s aesthetic where like they would zoom super close into like someone's face and it would get like all distorted and stuff. Oh, holy shit! You you're going to watch Cybermania right now because they spend half of the special doing that. With, oh, I like, love that man. Same zooms and stuff. So. <laughs> Um, oh, oh, and uh, th- he's uncredited, but um, the nominees are all announced by Shatner, who sounds incredible. Yeah, the, even the IMDb, I didn't give credit to the other guy you mentioned either. Leslie Nielsen? Uh, no, no, Leslie Nielsen was in there. Oh, okay. And yeah. Jonathan Taylor Thomas, but the yeah, guy yeah. that you said was uh, uh, Charles Fleischer, the, the voice of Roger Rabbit. He's just, yeah, he, a, didn't, he doesn't have credit. Yeah, he's just a presenter, like maybe an hour in, but. Uh, yeah, he just keeps on going through different, somewhat problematic voices, which is kind of fun to watch, especially now. <laughs> but yeah, you start to get an idea. Okay, I see why this guy, despite having a big hit being Roger Rabbit, maybe didn't really stick around. <laughs> uh, and then the Disney World, um, twenty might be the 20th. Yeah, it's actually the 20th anniversary of uh, Walt Disney World, which... Um, features where is it disneyland oh now i gotta now i gotta search this out sorry <laughs> and the the guy's name i was trying to think of before was peter lore the, the one producer? that uh, ren is based on oh oh peter Lohr. okay got you got you yeah yeah okay yeah we recently did m so we got the uh the scary yep, yeah he was an m yeah and, and of course he's in casablanca which uh get to eventually he was I I actually ended up watching a bunch of the movies that he was in. There was oh, yeah. uh he's in good stuff. I'm trying to remember. Okay, look I got to look at my watch history. I've been watching too much weird crap, I guess. So, there's Cybermania three times cuz I actually watch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh more just ephemera. Uh did you ever see the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles coming out of their shells tour? Specifically, the Shredder singing "I Hate Music." He sings a song about hating music. Well, he raps actually, so you could argue if you wanted to sound old that rap was not music, but <laughs> which might have been what the writers were doing in the early nineties. All right, I got it queued up. I hate music. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That. 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 That is some gold. Oh no, I spent too much time watching bumpers. <laughs> like cinema bumpers. I want to make sure I get I felt like such a crossroads with the the Ninja Turtles movie and uh Vanilla Ice with the Go Ninja Go. It felt like anything could have happened at that moment in time. Well, that's that the coming out of their shells tour is like anything can happen basically because it's insane. <laughs> bunch of guitar videos yeah. i guess i spent too much time on youtube the magic i went down the chris gaines rabbit hole do you remember that who chris gaines this actually you is something you might want to bring up somewhere it's, it's kind of interesting which is uh when garth brooks tried to do an alter ego 
Okay, this is special... that Chris Gaines? Is Garth Brooks? Yes, but there's nothing interesting about Chris Gaines, really. Like he was in a band. Uh, the story, the backstory is he was in a band. They had a hit. The singer died. Then he had a solo career. He had a car wreck. It screwed up his face. He has a sex addiction. He doesn't drink too much. He's not on drugs. He, he has a sex addiction with women. With women. So <laughs> that's like the you most. Get this interesting... right. You hear? You get that part right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really. Um, but yeah, it's it's bizarre, especially when you get Garth Brooks on stage as Garth Brooks trying to explain Chris Gaines. It's just like really weird. And you feel like you're watching some kind of MK Ultra breakdown. So and apparently it was supposed to be a movie called The Lamb. Yes, it was gonna he was gonna be the character. So he's like, I'll I'll put I'll make the album first, and then this the movie never happened, right? So very bizarre stuff but yeah this smells... is bizarre. I, I didn't know about this <laughs> but just you know because people are you know there's sasha sasha fierce and stuff you know otter egos and this is like the most it's almost like he was like i didn't get him trade ultra so i'm gonna try and walk the walk you know but he sounds <laughs> so nuts maybe he did i don't know we'll you know we never know these things uh the other one i'm talking about by the way is the disney 35th um anniversary celebration which starts off it has the muppets in a pretty good sequence um it starts off as an episode of cheers weirdly enough with uh several cast members and apparently the same creative people like it's got burroughs directing and then the whole special is directed by john landis which is also bizarre so <laughs> and but dj yeah. jazzy jeff and will smith performed before he was they were particularly <laughs> famous like Fresh that's Prince hadn't started yet, and they were just like, let's get someone that's not old to perform. And that's they made them like <laughs> write they they wrote the song like on the plane over, went to an LA recording studio, quickly recorded it, and then like the same day went into the special. So uh, yeah. Where they're doing a, a rap about super califragilistic. So <laughs> Ronald Reagan's in it. Yes, he makes. Well, they filmed him making a speech and put it in the episode. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And then again, Roger Rabbit plays every Disneyland employee in the thing. So it was a magical time, man. Nineteen ninety. Yeah, yeah, really. So all this, all this bizarre ephemera, you know, it's really worth bringing up every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been down weird rabbit holes, but uh, yeah, I would actually just in in terms of like your other stuff, uh, Chris Gaines is a, a definitely a bizarre like. There's an episode of Saturday Night Live where Garth Brooks is the guest and Chris Gaines is the musical guest. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird because it like even Chris Gaines looks like a dude that killed himself. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, really. Look. Yeah. Got look, like he was accused of doing something inappropriate with an underage fan and now and now he doesn't live anymore. Well, anyone with a soul patch ends up looking that way. <laughs> that, yeah, okay, yeah, that's that's a that's a huge aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't grow the soul patch. Um, I guess I need to run off, but uh, yeah, probably in two weeks or so we'll, we'll go for the rabbit. I'm excited about the rabbit. So hell yeah. Uh, the the next I, I rem that one I remember being in the theater for. It was like a big event. Yeah, the next couple are uh, Roger Rabbit, Oliver and Company, and then the Little Mermaid, which um. I wonder if it'd be possible to look at the newer one. Actually, my daughter went to see it. It was a, her birthday's July fourth, and she went to see the Little Mermaid. So, uh, I went to see Indiana Jones, which which she liked. Uh, they, that their school festival, one of the classes did Indiana Jones. So she was like, "I want to see the old movies." So my wife used like points to get like a Blu-ray of the first four. Right, that's cool. Um, <laughs> but then my daughter, I was like, "So what do you want to do? You want to see like a a." attractive young woman singing popular songs or do you want to see an old man punching people so <laughs> i wanted to see the old man punching people <laughs> um with yeah yeah the new indiana jones of course that has the um archimedes stuff which is kind of interesting i don't know how much you've you've heard on that one yet so not a lot but yeah it's it's got it's got some fun stuff um i, I don't think it's a spoiler because it's like within the first 10 minutes of the film that's basically um kind of based on that greek computer 
the one that the they found in a sunken ship and they found like a oh yeah 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 i yeah i know what you're talking about i don't know yeah what that, it's called. that's their that's their well uh they say it in the movie and, and i can't like astrolabe or something isn't it yeah 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 but it's got it's a mechanical device that functions as an, as an astrolabe but they found it in an ancient greek ship and that's the MacGuffin for the uh new indiana jones movie basically so that's your <laughs> ark of the covenant or your chakra stones or whatever it is so <laughs> they're not as good when they're not copying it directly out of a ducktales comic this one gets pretty new one's pretty ducktales yeah yeah you know punch of nazis it's always good i, I actually liked it. it's it got very mixed reviews but i actually did enjoy the the new indiana jones and, and definitely has like you know weird stuff for the the people looking into the ephemeral so <laughs> Like yeah, the they, they definitely third. have veered into that after like because the last one it was like the entire site was a huge UFO craft. I was like, okay, this is they ramped it up. Yeah, no, yeah. The new one basically follows the beats of the first or the third one, except it's just not mm -hmm. biblical this time. It's it's ancient mm -hmm. Greece, which that's great. Sure, why not? You know, <laughs> they can always... do that. Yeah, yeah. So they so they did, but yeah. Okay, but yeah, like I was saying, in two weeks or so, we'll we'll hit the rabbit. So, I will probably give uh, email you before too long about. Uh, uh, is this a better day for you now, or is it just this week? Uh, no, it was it was just this week. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember what I've got. But yeah, for whatever reason, I couldn't do it this week. Okay, that, that's cool. Then let me tentatively call it out as the twentieth. And obviously, if we need to recalibrate, we'll do that. Okay. Yeah. No. I just got. I had for some reason. I had two different shows tomorrow, from like seven. Oh to yeah. And ten. Now, now it's fine. I've just been podcasting all morning. I got up at my seven to do 1998's The Avengers. Also interesting for the conspiracy head because it includes weather. It's not a good movie, by the way, but includes uh uh weather manipulation, cloning. MK Ultra is all prominently featured in 1998's The Avengers. So this is. The one based on the TV series, yeah. Right. I didn't like this one when it came out because I was like, oh, an Avengers movie. And I was like, wait, what the hell is this shit? Why is this guy have like a <laughs> top hat and a cane? <laughs> I got brainwashed because I worked at the Warner Brothers Studio store at the time. So it, we, they were just showing promos for it, you know, all day mm -hmm. while I was working there. So I'll go see it. But again, it's not it's not good, but it is an interesting late 90s conspiracy dump. Just because it has it's got all a those five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. No, the reason we did it is because on Films and Filth it, it had a three point eight rating on um, IMDb, okay. so it's on our yep. bad list. So, <laughs> but still kind of interesting artifact from the late nineties, especially for for those reasons. So, yeah, as a movie, it's, it's uh, Sean Connery. You know, he's chewing up scenery. He gets to be the Bond villain for once, so that's that's fun. He's he's living it. But yeah, the rest of the movie's pretty slack and then luke our, our british co-host he was pissed at uma thurman's trying to do a british accent so <laughs> yeah. like it's, he, that's not and he was like these are the people we beat up you know we were, oh, let's go have tea in the garden he's like these are people you punch in the face you know so yeah <laughs> they don't the, okay. the cockney slang right okay oh i didn't people just heard all of that